Okay. So here's our training agenda for today. We'll be going over DBS specimen collection and processing, packaging, shipping, and the ROE, the remote order entry tutorial of the infectious diseases requisition form, which is the DOH 4463. We'll be going over the communicable disease reporting, the tutorial of the DOH 4189, which is a provider reporting form via EPRF and also receiving test results. If you're a brand new tester and a lot of this doesn't make sense right away, that's absolutely okay. Um, it should make a lot more sense as we go and it'll make a lot more sense once you put it into practice. So I'd like to kind of start by um, asking a question and seeing if we can get some answers in the chat or people to just kind of raise their hands or shout it out. I'd love to know, do we have, um, if you are a first time tester, so you're learning testing, you're new to testing and you haven't tested before, uh, please feel free to just put it in the chat or raise your hand so in the reactions. I'd love to see how many first time testers we might have. Oh, I'm seeing quite a few hands up. That's great. Wow, well, that's fantastic. Okay, great. So this is really great. That means we're getting a lot of new testers in and that this training is going to be really beneficial. So please, please don't hesitate to ask those questions. A lot of this information may seem foreign and overwhelming at first if you haven't done it and you are a first-time tester. Still learning. Started testing in May. Okay, so just a couple months in. Okay, great. I'm seeing some stuff coming through the chat. Lots of hands up. Thanks, everyone. Refresher, it's been quite a while. I know, right? Because if you don't do it, if you haven't received a rapid reactive, and we'll go over that, then, you know, most likely it may have been a very long time. You're right, until you've, since you've done a DBS. I know for me it was. So while everyone's putting some stuff in the chat, just a little bit of background. Um, I am newer to the Department of Health, but I do have 12 years of experience working in the field of HIV and many years experience providing testing at a previous community-based organization. So I have actually run and provided these tests myself as well. Refreshers. Okay. And once again, if you are a very seasoned tester who has done DBS very frequently, this training May, may not provide you anything that you don't already know. Okay, so it seems like we've got a lot of first-time testers and quite a few people with a refresher. And like I said, that makes perfect sense. Great. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for responding. Okay. All right, so our first topic is DBS specimen collection and processing. And let me just make sure I can see a version of myself. Yes, I can there. So that when I'm in presenter mode, unfortunately, I can't see all the other things. Um, just because I want to make sure that when I'm holding things up for you all to see that you can see it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so to start, this is a great question for first time testers. When do you run a DBS test? DBS tests are run after receiving a rapid reactive test result. So our folks here in the division that you receive your testing contracts from us, you are running that only after receiving a rapid reactive result. So that rapid test, whether it be a determine or a quick and insti, could take anywhere from one minute to 20 minutes to receive that result, usually done via the finger prick. Right. If you receive a rapid reactive, if you're not familiar with what reactive means, that kind of means a preliminary positive. Um, New York State doesn't recognize one rapid reactive as a confirmatory for HIV. Um, so that's another reason why we'll need to run the DBS for confirmatory. And we'll get more into HCV, which stands for hepatitis C virus um, as well. OK. So here are some of the supplies that you'll need. Your finger stick supplies, right? You're definitely going to need your hand sanitizer, right? Your gloves, your sharps container. Mine does not have a lid. It should have a lid. So please don't use this as an example. Um, your biohazard waste bags. And we'll have a photo of everything as well. Your surface disinfectant, your spill pad or your barrier that's kind of like a thick absorbent white piece of paper. 
um, your 70% alcohol, isopropyl alcohol wipes, some band-aids and some sterile gauze, which definitely should be stored like in a package, not just out like this. This is just for demonstration purposes. Um, you will need your DBS collection card and it looks like this, right? Your DBS collection card. Looks like this on the back and we're gonna, there's gonna be plenty of pictures. You will need your lancets. This, for those of you who are brand new testers, these are your finger stick devices. Yours may look a little bit different. They don't necessarily have to look like this. As long as they're a high flow blood volume lancet, this is the thing that you take the top off and you prick the finger with. Okay, you will also need your DOH4463, your infectious disease um, requisition form, which we will go over in detail and exactly how to fill it out later. You'll need glassine paper which is like this kind of thin absorbent paper, your drying and transport box, which we send to you, or you may use your own right here. Looks kind of like a jewelry box, a recycled jewelry box. Your gas and permeable plastic bags, which are um, really just fancier thick Ziploc bags. Uh, and shipping envelopes or box, whatever you choose to use. So this is kind of a good example as to what your testing area will look like. Um, so I did want to go over just briefly the difference between, as I said, remember my sharps container does not have a lid. It should have a lid like the one in the picture and your biohazard waste bag. So can anyone in the chat tell me the difference between what goes in a sharps container versus what goes into a biohazard waste bag? If you could either, you could unmute yourself and shout it out or feel free to put it in the chat. Blood goes in one and the needles go in the other. Great. Thank you. Yes, I know that in the Beoharsa, you put everything that has blood. And on the, um, the other one is the sharpening things, lancets and those things. Yes, fantastic. Exactly, right? So sharps container, anything that's sharp, right? Whether syringes, the lancets, anything that's sharp, right? and obviously would be used to prick someone's finger, goes into the sharps container. So fantastic, you all answered that perfectly. And then like you all just said, in the biohazard waste bag, I'm sorry, I'll just hold it up in front of me. The biohazard waste bag is, for example, right after you prick the finger, you'll take that gauze, wipe away the first drop of blood, that would go into your uh, biohazard waste bag. Great, fantastic. See, we've got a lot of pros in the audience. All right. Um, so is everyone familiar? Is anyone not familiar with any of the things that are um, seen here on the picture? We, ju we did just go over them, but if you have any questions now is a great time to ask. Okay, and if you do um, have questions too and you don't type them in, you are welcome to just unmute yourself and ask questions, please feel free. Uh, the forms on the lower right corner um, is, do you mean right here, Peggy? Do you mean this right here? That Christy, my cursor? I can't see your cursor, just so you know. So oh, we can't screen. see the cursor. Can you see the cursor oh, there, now? No, I can, yep. Okay, great. So right here, is that what we're talking about, Peggy? Yeah, she's nodding. Oh, she's nodding. I'm sorry. I can't see everyone. I truly yep. apologize. Um, that's actually your DBS test card, just upside down. So that's actually your DBS test card upside down. It's called a protein saver card. Can I can I ask something? Please, yeah. Um the the part that we pick the blood with, right? The lancet it goes yep. on the biohazard, right? Correct? Or the oh it goes on the sharp. I believe the it goes sharp. on the biohazard. So the Yep. So the lancet right here that you take the top off and you prick the finger with, it's sharp. So it goes into the sharps container. No, the other, the, the other part, not, not the lancet, the one that sucks the blood. The loop. The loop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. That goes into the biohazard. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. But also the loop you won't be using for DBS. You'll really only be using that for your rapid testing. 
Okay, so for the DBS, what would we be using? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. We're gonna, you're actually not going to be using anything like a little loop, and we're going to get into that completely right now. Okay. So we're going to go all through that, but please feel free, Maria, to re just, if you have more questions, please feel free as we go through to just keep asking. Thank you. That. You got it. I love questions, so thanks, everyone. Okay. Martha, were there any questions that I missed? Um, in the chat, um, just somebody noticed that the the OraQuick test is for HCV and not HIV. Maybe let yep. us mention that. Yep, and so we are going over DBS is run for both HIV and HCV. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and move forward, and I think a lot of the um, maybe some questions you may have will um, be really easily answered as we go have through. Your hand raised. I'm sorry, go ahead. Dervis has his hand raised. Did you have a question? Oh, no, no, sorry, I was not right. Okay, no, that's okay. Great, thanks everyone for noticing, because like I said, I, I'm in presenter mode, so I can't see it all. So I really appreciate everyone noticing those things for me. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so a lot of this you are already going to have down, right? So like this slide right here, we don't have to necessarily go over in detail because since all of you are only running a DBS after doing a rapid reactive, you're already gonna have all your supplies down, right? So you wanna make sure of course that you follow all of these, but you should already be in, have all your testing supplies down because you've already run a rapid. So make sure you change your gloves, get out your DBS test card, additional lancets, alcohol wipes, gauze, any other fresh testing supplies that you might need. Okay. You want to make sure that you describe, and we're going to go over that. So by the end of the section, you should, you know, definitely really feel more comfortable with describing how blood will be collected for the DBS card right here. Um, and you're going to explain the finger stick process, including the potential for more than one finger stick. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is prepare your DBS card. So under the name, you're going to put the client first and last name, and then in parentheses on the same line, you're going to put the client's date of birth looking in this same format exactly like you see here in this photo. Um, under date, you're going to put the collection date. The collection date is the date that you collected the blood sample. So it should be, if you're doing it today, it would be today's date. Um, what goes in parentheses is the TCID. The TCID is something in AIRS, the AIDS Institute Reporting System. Um, depending on the structure of your agency, you may have data folks or other folks who enter those things. You may or may not know the client's TCID. Please refer to your agency structure and your supervisor for how your agency um, likes to enter those things and who would enter those things because all agencies do it a little bit differently. Um, for criminal justice initiative funded providers. You offer anonymous confirmatory testing only in the correctional facilities, as you know. So in the name, you'll place a non-identifying client ID, and then the collection date will be the collection date. Okay, so I'll just pause for a second for any questions. Here is just, as I'm pausing here, it's just like an example right here of how I filled out this card. I'm trying to, my virtual background makes it hard for you to see. Right, I wrote Jane Doe, her date of birth, and the collection date. Okay. So if you have any questions about this, please feel free to unmute. Or Martha, did we miss any in the chat? Can you explain good parentheses? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. So I didn't think in the chat, but I think I heard somebody just ask about the number in the parentheses. The, oh, the number in the parentheses? And did you already answer that, Martha? It was not in the chat. It's a verbal question that somebody just asked. That we, we stepped on each other, so. Okay. And not so like the, the cards that we have don't have those, that we would be providing to you don't have those. Martha, did you want uh -huh. to add anything to that? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the picture shows the TCID as well in the parentheses here. So depending on which program you're doing DBS for, 
um, you may or may not be putting the TCID on the card. Thank you. Uh, hello. I would love to know, like, what is the SN the number uh, on top? Martha, did you want to take that one? Uh, the SN number, that's the number that's the lot number on the card from the dried blood stock company that manufactures it. Now, the ones that we are giving out to you, the lot number, it will not be kind of up top like this. It actually is on the bottom, very small on the back. Um, and just to reiterate again, the TCID is in AIRS, the AIDS Institute reporting system for folks who are brand new. Um, that is the AIDS Institute's uh, client electronic medical record, for lack of a better word. And the data, the TCID is the basically client ID or the patient ID in AIRS, in the AIDS Institute reporting system. As I said, based on how your agency is structured, you may or may not be the one inputting that. So at, feel free to ask your supervisor um, as you may not even know the, the client TCID, and it, you may have a data person that may put that in there, but it, it, all of all agencies do it very differently. So feel free to ask your supervisor. Okay. Martha, do we miss any other questions or are we okay to move to the next slide? You're okay to move forward. Thanks. Hi, Christy. Yeah. Um, hi, I just put a question in the chat. So is the TCID number required on the DBS card? It is not, it is preferred, but not required. Thanks, Dana, that's a great question. So preferred, but not required. Okay. All right, so we'll go forward and uh, Martha will stop me at the end of each slide if there's questions that we miss. Uh, and Martha's also fantastic at answering the questions in the chat as well. Okay. So yes, we went through this slide. Yep, okay, now we're gonna go to this slide. Um, basically, you wanna choose a finger, right? So that's the first thing that you wanna do. You wanna ask the client to start rubbing their hands together, right? Warm them up, stimulate blood flow, right? You wanna avoid the thumb and the pinky finger. The best options are your middle or your ring finger. Don't use the tip or the very center of the fingertip. Aim to press the lancet, right? The little sharps into the side, of the fingertip at an angle. If at all possible, if you can avoid fingers that are bruised, maybe heavily calloused or scarred, um, you just do the best you can. If you can avoid it, great. If you can't, that's okay. Make sure that you are thoroughly cleaning the finger with your alcohol wipe. And then you're either gonna wipe the finger dry with your sterile gauze, or you're going to let the finger dry completely, air dry completely before proceeding. Any questions about um, how to kind of select a finger. Hi, I have a question. You said that, um, my name is Adonis. Um, you said that not to go directly into the top of the finger or directly into the middle of the finger. The fingertip, yep. The fingertip, um, go into the, go in at an angle. Why is that? The main reason why is you're going to get the best blood flow from that. Martha, did you want to provide any additional information? Yeah, it's usually a less calloused area. So the, the skin is a little thinner and will we'll be more receptive to the lancet than a calloused end of the finger. Okay, thank you. Great questions. Okay. Um, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, do you find it, uh, uh, to, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the right word, but do you find it maybe a little bit challenging when you're taking blood from someone that, that is an IV drug user? I like, think it really, I think it just, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're an IV drug user or not. I think really it matters if their hands are warm. That's one of the biggest things. It is, and I have done a lot of finger sticks um, for rapid, and I would say maybe probably no more than a handful of DBS, as we know we don't get as many of those. Um, and I think the biggest thing isn't so much if they're an IV drug user, but whether their hands are cold or not. Um, 
that's like the biggest problem I've had, especially in the winter or things right. like that, or just in general for folks who don't have, maybe have medical conditions, don't have good blood circulation. Right. That's right. been the, for me personally in the past, that's been the thing I found the most challenging is the temperature of the hand. Um, or if someone maybe has a circulation issue, I've not had issues with folks um, that use um, that are ID. Okay. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't, you know, I don't want to be offensive or anything like that. I just didn't know how to properly like ask the question you know, like that. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Thanks for asking. Thank yeah, you. It's really more the temperature of the hand and that the circulation is good. So you want to make sure that the, that the patient client uh, is maybe sitting down for a couple of minutes, maybe warm, uh, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Absolutely. That's what we ask them to rub their hands together. Another thing too, is if their hands are kind of cold and I, I have this in a, um, in one of the upcoming slides, but it's a great idea to ask them to, if you're, if you notice their hands aren't really warming up, they can stand up and kind of like squeeze their hands, maybe kind of gently get the blood flow going because if they stand up and their arms are significantly below their heart, the great thing is, is that's a great way to get the blood flowing down into the fingertips. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, no, these are great questions. I'm really happy everyone's asking questions. I'm sorry. I have another question. Shoot. Yeah. Um, so is it mandatory to, 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 um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Is it mandatory for them, for us to do it in that way, in that manner, when it comes to testing or pricking the finger? Because I have seen some or experienced some testing sites, not the Alliance for Positive Change, um, but other locations where they actually did prick it close towards the middle of the finger or they didn't do it at an angle? Yeah, so great question. So it's not, however, it's not like 100% required. You can choose to prick the fingertip um, or I mean the center of the fingertip or the top. It's completely actually up to what your agency structure, you should follow your agency's um, training and policies and procedures for how they do it. But these, the way that we're recommending it is best practices. Um, because we know that the size of the finger versus the very tip of the fingertip or the center has statistically worked a lot better. So folks can, if their agencies um, do it a different way, that's okay. But these are just kind of best practices. Does that make sense and help to answer your question, Adonis? Yes, ma'am. That was a great answer because I'm like, I, I'm in my, in my getting tested, <laughs> me getting tested. Um, I, I've noticed that everyone does it differently. So I'll, when you brought this slide up, I'm like, wait, that's not how such and such has done it. Yeah. This, yeah. Okay. But yeah, thank these you are so definitely much. best practices. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, okay. So Martha, any questions that we missed before we move on to the next slide? So there is one question. Any tips for clients who have hyperhidrosis, excessive sweating? Who have hyper, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Hydrosis, which means excessive sweating. Um, Martha, feel free to step in. You know, definitely continuing to use gauze to dry the hand. Any other tips, Martha? No, I mean, it, it shouldn't affect you being able to get a good um, blood drop. It's just, you know, like Christy said, just have gauze on hand to dry the finger. Great. Okay. Any other questions? I think there were a few people I saw maybe trying to unmute themselves. Someone's asking, why is it called dried blood spot? Do I take that one, Martha? Are you sure. I'll write it in the chat as well. Great. Okay. There is a hand raised for Ricky. Yeah, please go ahead. If you're trying, yeah, go ahead. Hi there. Um, so I've often had problems whenever I have um, gotten the blood and it's like molasses and then you put it in the little insti and it clots and bubbles and it's all in the way. Are there, are there any remedies for this or just start over? Um, unfortunately, if someone, you know, their blood kind of really clots, the best thing is to probably choose another finger. Uh, Martha, I'll let you jump in as well with any other additional tips. Uh, I don't have any. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The best thing is to just select another finger. I, I know it can, it's right. Like these are all best practices. And in theory, right. It's like, Oh, if, in theory, it's like all of this works perfectly. If you have like 
a, you know, like the perfect specimen of like a super warm hands, no clotting issues. Um, you know, maybe someone who's on blood thinners, which obviously we don't, <laughs> that's not necessarily a good thing, but you, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's easier said than done, right? Because in the field is very different than versus training. So I completely understand that. I think your best choice is probably just to choose another finger. I'm, you know, I've run into that issue myself um, in the past and I'm sorry, I wish I had, I wish I had a better answer for you. I mean, um, so it's, it's that, but so is the blood different on different fingers? Because when I take the blood, I guess, I think maybe they're dehydrated because it comes out so thick and then I put it in the little dish for Insti and then it, you know, it's like bubbly or it's, it's, <laughs> it's too concentrated. And then it usually gets in the way of, of the dot on the Insti dish. Yep. That could be, and um, that could, that could be the case. It is a, never a bad idea to offer a client a glass of water and to, you know, wait 15 minutes. That's always it. That's always a good tip. Um, and remember too, we're talking, I mean, it's we're great to talk about rapid, but we are also making sure that this is very specifically focused to DBS. But yes, um, Ricky, you're absolutely right that offering a glass of water can never hurt if the client, because if people are dehydrated, that can definitely affect the samples. So great, great point in bringing that up. Does that help to answer your question? Great, I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay, good. Okay. All right, Martha, are we okay to move to the next slide? Yes, go ahead. All right, so this is all gonna be fingertip collection tips continues, right? So all these next slides are gonna be very similarly titled. So we're at that point, right, where we've um, where we've got the hand, we've got the finger, we've got our whole testing supplies down, we're ready to go. You may need, like we just talked about before, to request some assistance in moving the client's hand. You always wanna make sure that their hand is below their heart. Um, or like I said before, you may need to ask them to stand to help increase the blood flow. You're gonna take the top off of your lancet Press the lancet firmly against the skin. As you can see, I'm going in at the side here. And do not remove the lancet from the finger until you hear the click. So when you press it firmly, you're going to hear it click. Then you're immediately going to throw it into your sharps. Okay? So right after you prick the finger and you throw in your um, sharps, your lancet and sharps container, you are going to, that very first drop of blood that comes out, you're going to wipe it away with your sterile gauze and put that in your biohazard bag. Then you want to ensure that the client's hand, right, is over the circles on the DBS card, as you can see in the picture there. And with the finger extended, and I'm doing it like this for showing you purposes, you don't ever want to have their hand up like that. Um, you want to make sure that you are gently milking the finger. That may help, right, from the wrist all the way up to the finger, but gently. We don't want to squeeze too hard or that could limit, that could restrict the blood foot flow, right? Because let's say, I know when you've gotten a cut, right, they say put pressure on it to stop the bleeding. So we want to just gently kind of milk from the wrist up to the tip of the finger. Now, I will say that DBS is not, it's not the most challenging test to get, but it's not the easiest test. So you know, please don't be frustrated with yourself or the patient. One of the biggest things here is to try to be patient and empathetic. Another thing to be empathetic is think about where you're at in the testing process and your client. And this is a little off topic, but I think it really does help. Um, you know, the reason why you're running a DBS is because you've just given a rapid reactive for either HIV or HCV, hepatitis C, to your client that's sitting in front of you there is a very good chance, not all, but a very good chance that person may be shocked by that result. Uh, they could do anything from be incredibly upset, be completely silent and shut down because they're in shock, ask a million questions, just try to remember to be empathetic and patient because this may very well be a very difficult time for this client that they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. And now they're having to sit to run a confirmatory test. So just to keep that in mind, to be client-centered. Um, also getting back to the technical side of things, you want to allow the drop to fork, fall carefully within the circles on their own. So the client's finger should never touch the filter paper. So the filter paper that I'm going to touch here, but you should, you know, do this is the, um, the paper it's of a different material that the circles are actually on. Okay. So the client's finger, your finger, you know, don't touch the filter paper. Don't layer the drops of blood on top of each other, even if you don't fill that circle completely. 
If the client's, client's blood clots before completing, request consent to try another finger. So, you know, this is kind of the toughest part is if you have someone with cold hands, it may be tough to get four to five single drops of blood. So please remember that you don't want to touch the client's finger to the paper. You want to allow four to five separate drops of blood to fall into the circle. It is perfectly okay if it doesn't fill the circle. It's okay if it goes a tiny bit outside the circle. It doesn't need to be perfect. You just want to make sure you don't oversaturate and layer the blood drops. Um, each DBS card contains four or five circles. The ones that we've recently been sending out to all of you contain five. Filling four or five circles is preferred. The minimum for testing for HIV or HCV is two first two full circles. If you happen to be testing for both HIV and HCV confirmatory, you must fill all of the circles. So if you're doing both HIV and HCV on the same test card, you need to fill all the circles in. If you're just doing one or the other, it's best to fill all the circles in, best practice, but a minimum of two circles is required for testing. The main reason why it's best to fill in all the circles is because if some of your specimens weren't accurate in let's say one or two of the circles, then they have two to three other circles. The lab has two to three other circles to be able to retest and not have to ask you to go back and get another sample from the client. Does that make sense to everyone? And I'll pause here um, for some questions. Uh, Louisa, did you raise your hand? Please feel free. Go ahead and just unmute yourselves. Hi, thank you. Um, so would it be preferable to collect blood from the client's finger onto the paper? Could we also use the little plastic thing that, what is it called? That little plastic apparatus to like collect the blood? Yeah, the little, the little loop. No, actually you're not. So you should not use that. Um, you should not be using the loop. Um, and off the top of my head, you're right. I can't, there is a, a name and I can't, it's like I'm drawing a blank. Um, but you should not use the loop. Very good question, but no, you actually want that, that drop of blood has to free fall from the finger onto that, te this test paper right here. So very good question, but no, you do not want to use the loop. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Christy, someone is asking, where do they get these kits? Oh, that's great. So um, if you are funded under the division of HIV, STD, and HCV prevention, um, which most of you, if not all of you are, um, and you have a CTR, a counseling, a CTR counseling, testing, and referral, so a testing contract, which is how the majority of you are funded um, with us here at the AIDS Institute, I actually provide all of the test kits. So um, whether you have a testing supervisor or how your agency is structured, it's very different. Someone will be requesting the test kits there's a form that they fill out. Um, I can send that along as well. I can Once I send out all of the um, PDF of the presentation slide, I can send that form out. Um, but remember, uh, if you are a tester yourself, you may not be the one filling out that form to request the supplies. It may be your supervisor or someone else at your agency. So please just ask your supervisor and follow your agency structure on who would request that. So I will send that um, order supply form along with the PDF of the slides as well. Um, so really it's pretty simple. You fill out the form and then I send the test, the supplies and I send the actual test kits all for free out to all of you that are funded under the division. Great question. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Martha, give me a thumbs up if we're good to move. You're good to go. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so we won't go over these in detail, but these right here are really just examples of invalid specimens, right? So um, as we can see the first one, there's just not enough of, there's not enough blood there. Um, the second one, it appears very scratched. Um, the third one, it's completely red and not brown, so it's not dry. Um, the fourth one, right, it's super saturated, um, and we don't have to go through all of them, but these are just some examples of what things were to look like that would be rejected by the lab. Okay, next we're gonna go on to DBS drying. So, right, we've gotten the sample that we needed, we've 
filled everything out, right? Our card is, you know, all set and filled out. And now we want to dry it. So you want to slightly bend the card away from the cover, right? And you can do one of two things. On a flat surface, you can either lay it. You want to just bend this back. I'm sorry, you can't really see. Bend this back a little bit and kind of lay it flat because what we don't want to do is we don't want the actual test card, the blood to get saturated and to seep into the back of this part of the card, if that makes sense. That's why it's kind of good to bend the cover away a little bit so that when you're laying it, as you can see here, it has a little bit of space. So a couple options. You can take your spill pad um, and lay it flat and dry it that way. Or you may use your transport box, which just looks like a recycled jewelry box. Um, now, these also, we provide these. So when your order forms come in, we provide these. These, are, these come with your testing supplies that you order from us for DBS specifically. Okay, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to place your DBS. First, you're going to place your glassine paper down, right, in the box. Then you're going to want to angle, oh, I would say actually place a couple desiccant packs. Desiccant packs are silica gel packs. Um, they're basically, you know, when you buy a new pair of shoes and you find them in like the box of your shoes, they're basically the same thing. That's what these are. We call them desiccant packs or silica gel packs, same thing. They reduce the humidity and the moisture. So put, I would say, up to four, right? Up to four of those in the box to reduce humidity. And then you're going to want to put the card in the box, making sure it's not laying entirely flat. And then you may cover the box, ensuring that your air holes are facing upwards. There must be at least four holes in the drying box lid. If you get them from us, there will be four holes please make sure that there are four holes at least in the lid of this drying box. Please make sure to not use an external heat source such as a fan or a hair dryer. Um, the DBS cards must dry naturally on their own. Um, the wet blood spots should not contact any other surface. And when dry, they'll appear dark brown, right? So if you've ever seen dried blood, it turns like a dark brown color. Um, it's recommended that you dry specimens for at least four hours but preferably overnight prior to mailing. So best practices overnight, but a minimum of four hours. Make sure that you ensure your drying space is confidential to protect client confidentiality because you will have client identifying information on this DBS card. So I'll pause there for any questions. I have a question. Also, I know that we also put one piece of paper that is something for dry too. The glassine paper? In uh, a piece of paper. I don't know what kind. Yes. That yep, one. the glassine paper. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Yep, you'll put that down in the bottom of the box. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and move forward. Okay, so once again, slightly different for CJI, Criminal Justice Initiative funded providers. Since our CJI providers are providing anonymous testing only, which is different from the rest of how all of you other folks do it, they will need the DBS inventory report form, which I'll show on the next slide, your 4189 via EPRF, which we're gonna go into fully, um, they will need their testing supply clearance, meaning entering docs with a Lancet, um, you want to do it in docs medical only and updated agency policies and procedures reflecting the anonymous DBS testing process and staff training since it is a bit different in the correctional facilities. And this is for CJI funded correction, cr criminal justice initiative, CJI funded providers only. So for CJI folks, this is what that inventory report form looks like. Please feel free to contact your OC. OCJS contract manager for information and guidance on how to complete and submit this form. Okay, so next we're gonna go, right? We've taken the test, we've dried the test appropriately. Now we need to pack and ship and do the remote order entry of the 4463. Are there any questions before on, you know, taking the test, um, getting the sample and drying it before we move forward to this next section?
Okay. Nothing in the chat. Okay, great. And if you think of something, you know, it's okay. If we're, even if we're moved on to a different section, if you think of something and it pops in your head, please feel free to put it in the chat. It's, it's absolutely okay. We'd rather answer any of your questions, even if we're not on that topic. All right. So packaging your DBS card, ensure your blood spots are completely dry, right? So you can see in this photo right here, can you all see my cursor? Okay, that they're looking kind of like that brown color. Fold the cover at the crease so it lays over the filter paper and tuck it into the flap. Verify that your client information matches your requisition form, which we're gonna go over in a minute, exactly. So when I say fold the cover at the crease, I mean can, like this, and then everyone sees the crease right here. You're just going to kind of whoop, fold it into the flap like that. Does that make sense? Okay. Follow the same instructions for both HIV and HCV DBS. Now, packaging the card. You probably will not have eight DBS samples at once. If you do, wow, <laughs> that means you have that's fantastic work. So that's great. That means you have definitely identified a lot of individuals in need of testing and treatment. Um, but for best practices, you may place up to eight cards, um, each separated by that glassine paper into your gas impermeable plastic bag, which is just another name for your fancy thick Ziploc bag. Add those desiccant packs, right? Those silica gel packs into the plastic bag, press as much air out of the bag as possible, and then you can store the sealed bag at room temperature but away from direct sunlight. Mail them as soon as possible because all DBS cards, all test cards must be processed within 15 days from collection. And that 15 days includes the time the DBS cards will be in transit during shipping. Okay. So now we have got our DBS card, exactly like in this photo, right? We've got some DBS cards in the bag. They're separated by the paper. Our um, bag is sealed up. Our desiccant packs are in the bag. We're good to go, right? So now you're gonna either get your um, plain shipping envelope or box, whatever you choose. Remember, each DBS card must have that corresponding 4463 remote order entry shipping manifest printout included in the mailing envelope. That we're going to, I promise we're going to go over all of that and you will even have screenshots to see exactly what that looks like. The external envelope or box doesn't require special handling. Um, and you can mail obviously via USPS or whatever shipping vendor your agency uses, UPS, FedEx, whatever. Um, we do recommend though that USPS has been having some delays and sometimes they've been receiving, the lab has been receiving specimens later than 15 days. So if, if you're going to go, I would say now with USPS, we're recommending choosing priority shipping just because they've had a lot of delays. Okay, so this is the correct shipping address right here. And this is exactly what your envelope or box should look like, right? Correct shipping address here, correct shipping address, and then your return, which hopefully won't get any returns. You want to make sure you have your agency name, the address, and the contact person. So that may very well be whoever is handling specimens at your agency, which may be very different based on your agency structure. Your supervisor can absolutely tell you that information. So please make sure that you use this correct address and that you're doing the appropriate return shipping. Okay. All right, any questions on that before we move into our ROE tutorial? Okay, fantastic. So um, a lot of the next parts of the training are going to be very data heavy. Um, so as I said, depending on your agency structure, you may or may not be the one filling out these forms that we're describing and going over, but it's a very important part of the process of submitting a DBS hit test kit. So that's why we want to make sure that going over these in detail, especially for folks, if you are on this training and you are the person at your agency that's going to be submitting these and you haven't done it before, these sections are going to be really important for you. Okay. So just as a reminder, the DOH 4463 or the infectious diseases requisition form 
is basically the lab form, for in lack of a better word, that goes with the DBS test kit, right? So I put Jane Doe on here and her date of birth uh, and the date. And I need to make sure to have a form with all of her information that matches this. Because if I send this in without the form, with all of her information, they're not going to know who, the lab's not going to know who to match this card to, if that makes sense. So that's really what it is. It's a detailed form, but it's a patient history. It's her information, address, all the information that you can get. Okay. So the, all of this may seem a bit confusing, um, but please bear with me and ask questions. And once again, you may or may not be the person submitting this for your agency based on your agency structure. So Wadsworth has moved to submitting all DOH 4463s, infectious diseases requisition forms, via online, which is called remote order entry or ROE, through HCS, which is the health commerce system. And inside HCS is a application called CLIMS, which stands for Clinical Laboratory Information Management System. Very long, very wordy. Um, if your agency's computer systems are down, you may still submit the paper version of the 4463. This form was updated in January 2022. The link to the form with the instructions can be found here, and all these links are active. So when you receive the PDF of the slides, you will be able to click on all of these links. Now, the remote order entry user guide, in case um, you need some additional information, you can find that at this link. And down below at the last link is a great quick start training guide. So if you click on the last link and you scroll down to training resources, there are some fantastic um, training guides on CLIMS, uh, ROE, and some other great uh, accessing report, test result reports. There's some great um, quick start training guides that will be really helpful for folks that are new to using HCS. Okay. Now I know that that was a lot of information, so I will pause very quick. If anyone has questions, unmute yourself or feel free to put them in the chat. Christy, there's been some questions about expiration dates and when the cards don't come in the original box, which is where the expiration date is located. Um, and if they're unsure of the expiration date of the cards that they have, what do you suggest they do? Yeah, so we've actually switched to now on the um, order form, we're writing the um, lot number and the expiration date. So on a go forward, that should not be an issue. Um, on the order form that you'll receive that will go into the box or shipping envelope that we sent out, you will receive the expiration date for your test so that you can notate that. Great question. Okay. Any other questions we can answer before we move forward? Okay. Martha, nothing else in the chat for right now? Oh, you're on mute, Martha. Nope, you can go ahead. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the first part of this is to set up an HCS account. At your agencies, this is now the way that you all receive test results. So at all of your agencies already most likely have, unless you're a brand new testing program, an HCS account set up. But the, these are the links to do that. You'd want to obtain access to the application title CLIMS, and then your agency's health provider network or HPN coordinator could provide you with both access to HCS and CLIMS. Now, if you already have an existing HCS account, so let's say you're a super testing supervisor or a supervisor, if you're the person at your agency that would be viewing test results and assisting with filling out these forms, if you already have an existing HCS account for either ordering testing materials or receiving test results, you can still use that same existing HCS account. If you have any questions regarding HCS and CLIMS, feel free to click on this email below, outreach support at health.newyork.gov. Okay, so here are our screenshots. Um, if any of you are obviously in CLIMS right now, you're welcome to follow along, but if not, um, the great thing is, is that you're gonna be getting a PDF of these slides. So these screenshots, when you're going through for the first time and actually doing your first ROE, will be really helpful to have these screenshots um, side by side or printed out however you prefer so that you can go through and see, okay, this is where I click. Okay, 
So on the left hand side, you're going to click on the CLIMS application. It's very tiny. So it doesn't really jump out at you when you log. So you log into HCS, and then the first thing you do under My Applications is click on CLIMS. Okay. Then you click on Remote Order right here. Then next, you go to Place Order DOH4463. Then click um, Human Specimen as we're not testing any animals. So human specimen. Then you're gonna select your facility from the drop-down menu. I do wanna take note, all of these screenshots are from a training environment that we use internally here at DOH. So these are not, any of the data you're seeing is fake data. It's nothing, um, it's nothing related to clients that are real. This is from a training environment we use for these purposes. So your facility, as you're already registered and have a testing program, you'll click from the drop-down menu. Okay. And then you're going to click add a patient, which you will see over here. Yep. You're going to click add a patient. Then the patient information page. So this big page, it's longer than this, but it's hard to get it all in a screenshot. You're going to fill out all the required fields. So all the required fields those marked with the red asterisk, you're going to fill out. In the submitter patient ID right here, you're just going to put the TC ID. Make sure to do the last name, first name, the sex, and patient birth date. Now, the sex should be how the client identifies in their gender identity, not necessarily the sex at birth. So there are a lot of, multi there are a lot of choices. It's not just male, female here. Okay, fill in the address, the city, the county of residence, the state, and the zip code. Full addresses are preferable, but not required. What is required is the county of residence and the state is required for submission. So that's at minimum. Once again, race and ethnicity are not required, but highly advised to complete this form. Um, you always want to ask the client if they're pregnant. It's very important, particularly for HCV, DBS testing. And if they're pregnant, check that box that they're pregnant and then state the trimester that they're in. Under the relevant treatment information, which you can't see in this screenshot, I'm sorry, but it is, it's below. Um, you want, if a client is on PrEP or antiretroviral therapy, you always want to state that they are on PrEP or ARBs, the type of medication the client is on in this, in this section. Um, please take note that the name here and the date of birth listed on your DBS test card must match exactly. So the name, and the date of birth on the first line of your DBS card, spelling and everything should match exactly to what you're putting in here. Does that make sense? Okay, great. And then at both the top and the bottom of the page, so there's this, uh, there's these three buttons at the top and they're also at the bottom. You're going to click add a test right here. Okay, so quick tip. Oh, does someone have a question, Martha? Yeah, Martha, yeah. Um, so is there an asterisk next to the TCID in that remote ordering? The submitter patient ID, the TCID, yes, there is an asterisk. It will, however, allow you to move, great question, it will, however, allow you to move forward if you do not enter it. Okay, thank you. So it is best practices, preferred, not required. Great question. Okay, so just quick thing for CJA providers, as you're doing anonymous DBS testing, when you are completing this section, just place in um, the collection date, right, and the a non-identifying client ID in the section. You don't have to fill anything else. It will not stop you from moving forward. Because you're doing anonymous testing in the correctional facilities, it won't stop you from moving forward if you just put in like you just put in anonymous. So under like name, just put in anonymous, uh, you know, date of birth, just leave it blank. Um, just make sure that you have the collection date and the client ID does need to match what you wrote on this card. So if you just wrote um, the client ID, right? So we talked about before how CJ providers in the name would put that non-identifying client ID, however your agency decides that. Um, and then the collection date. Make sure that, that mat the card matches what goes into the ROE. And we have to make sure that there are at least two identifiers. So CJA providers, that's why we need the non-identifying client ID and the collection date 
because Wadsworth has to have two identifiers to match it minimum. Okay. So next, under, so we're going to go through both for HIV and HCV, because for this, we're just going to pretend we're doing both, right? So under a sign test, there's this little search bar over here. You're going to type in HIV. And then down here, so you're going to hit search, you're going to hit search or enter. I think enter works just fine. And then you're going to find the one that says HIV rapid test confirmation dried blood spot. And you're going to check and click that one. Then don't click on order tests if you're ordering yet, if you're ordering both HIV and, and HCV. If you're only doing one or the other, then you can go ahead and click on order tests, which is down here um, in the bottom. Okay. Please repeat that. Yeah. So I'll go back to this slide. Do you want to repeat the whole thing? Yes. Okay. So in this search box, you're going to type in HIV. Then what you're going to hit enter or search. And what's going to come up is a bunch of different tests over here for HIV. You're going to select the one that says HIV rapid test confirmation dried blood spot. Then if you're not ordering any other tests, so if you're not also doing an HCV, you're going to click order tests. Does that make sense? Great. Get a thumbs up. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Now next, same thing. Let's say I was doing just HCV. I would type in HCV up here. And then under assigned tests, I would select the one titled HCV qualitative RNA. Check the box and hit order tests. As said below, if you're ordering both HIV and HCV tests together on the same DBS card, select both tests before clicking the order test button so that they're ordered at the same time. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Now, we're going to come to sort of like the test details page. So um, here, the submitter, the, I mean, sorry, the specimen type is always going to be primary. So you can select primary from the drop down menu. The um, source is always going to be dried blood spot because that's what we're doing this training, right, for DBS. Um, this you can just leave blank as other. That's fine. Um, submitted on and in, you're, you can also leave blank. And then submitter specimen number is that client TCID. Now, this will give you an error if you do not necessarily, if you don't fill this out. So that's why a lot of times it ends up being a supervisor or data folks that fill these out um, because they do need the TCID. You can, of course, if you don't use the TCID, put your agency's version of the client ID in here. But best practices and what the lab truly prefers is for that AIRS TCID to go in here. Okay. Now the collection date down here, of course, is the date you collected the sample, right? So this really should be filled out within a day or two. Um, your reason for submission is always going to be confirmation because you're, you're basically confirming um, your rapid reactive result. Um, if you're ordering both HIV, as you can see, and HCV here, they're going to ask, you know, for multiple tests, please specify priority. So that's why as an example, I just put priorities HIV in here. It's not mandatory. And most of you will only be ordering one or the other and not both at the same time. And then you will hit save changes right here. Everyone can still see my cursor, right? I'm on the right screen. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. So next, this is going to bring you to your patient list page. Easy, you're just going to go here to the drop down menu and click, and you're going to click on Wadsworth. It all, it'll already auto populate. So all you have to do is just click on it. And I think it's like the first or second choice down. Then all you have to do up here, um, I'm sorry, actually, let's hit continue to review. Then you're going to hit continue to review over here. I'm jumping between two screens. I apologize. Um, okay, now. You can expand the client information because you're in the review page. So you can click on the TCID. You can basically click on anything like here. Um, and I went back. You can click on anything in this row and it will expand the client details. I usually just click on the TCID um, and I'm putting TCID in there for purposes. You would actually have the actual TCID in there. Um, 
and you can click on any, basically anything right here, it will expand. You want to scroll down and review all that client information, double check your DBS card, right? And make sure that all the information on there is correct. Make sure there's no errors, because if there is, you can always go back and that's a great time to fix the errors. Once you've reviewed, everything's accurate, you can go ahead and click submit, which is right here. Okay, this brings you to your shipping manifest, which means like you're done and you're like, oh my gosh, thank God, please, I'm done. <laughs> so, because it was a long process, right? So, your shipping manifest, this is what it will look like. When I was talking about the, the form that you needed printed out, right, in your shipping envelope, with each DBS card, this was that page, the shipping manifest. So all you're gonna do is hit print order right up here. And then this is what your printed out shipping manifest will look like. So per client, most of you will not be submitting more than one DBS at a time. But if you are per client, you're going to print out this form. It will look exactly like this. As you can see, it would have the client's TCID. Um, it would have both tests. It would have um, everything, where it's coming from. Um, it will have everything you need. And these are the barcodes that are the lab scans to make sure that they're matching the DBS card to the right patient. So they cannot accept your DBS sample unless you have this form printed out and placed into your shipping envelope or box. Okay, so that's the end of how to fill out the 4463 infectious diseases requisition form. I know that was a lot. I'm going to pause for any questions. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know this is. I like have a question. More... Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, could you repeat where I get the TCID? Um, I'm sorry. Did you want Did you want to know more about what the TCID is or where it's placed in? Yeah, yeah. What the TCID is. Okay. So the TCID is the AIRS Client Identifying ID. So AIRS is the AIDS Institute reporting system, which is the AIDS Institute's electronic medical record. So if you are a tester directly yourself, you may not see errors are going to it based on your agency structure. But basically it is the client ID. So the client identifying ID, right? That the AIDS Institute uses to place your clients into the system. Did that help to answer your question, Paula? Yes, thank you so much. Anytime. Hi, Christy. Yeah. I just wanted to just add a little bit about the TCID number. Um, so when client, when, uh, intake form is completed and entered into AIRS. That's when the TCID number is actually assigned. So ultimately, it, upon testing, um, the TCID number is not assigned because that, that documentation usually is not entered into AIRS as of yet. So when the information is entered into AIRS, and the, in, and the individual is assigned as a client, that's when they'll receive the TCID. And usually it's within the program status of heirs. And that's usually you know, with the data, the data entry individuals. So I just wanted to clarify that for individuals that are not familiar with TCID numbers. That's fantastic. That's a perfect way to explain it. Thank you, Dana. And if you are, if you're not a person who's going to go into errors, then you don't, you may not necessarily need to know this information, but for our data folks or folks that are entering this, that's a great example. Thank you. It was great that Diana explained that because yes, I, I never know about the air. Yeah, Diana's great. She's amazing at explaining things. Thank you. Okay. So the Wadsworth, which is the lab, right? Um, these are all of your contact folks in case you do have specific questions. I mean, of course, you can reach out to me and my contact information will be at the end. But if um, folks have specific questions for Wadsworth, these are great resources. These folks are great resources for their phone numbers and their emails are right here for you. Okay, now we're on to our last section. All right, communicable disease reporting. 
So communicable disease reporting. Um, Wadsworth will submit all reportable, Wadsworth is the lab, HIV and HCV lab results to the eclairs system. I really like the name of it also because I love eclairs um, per New York State Public Health Law. So eclairs, as you can see above, stands for the Electronic Clinical Laboratory Report System. Um, reactive HIV confirmatory and reactive HCV confirmatory, RNA only, test results report will be made by Wadsworth, the lab, to the local health department uh, in the county in which the patient resides in and will be submitted within 24 hours of diagnosis. HIV results are reported statewide while HCV results are reported countywide. Um, please take note, once receiving an HIV reactive slash positive confirmatory DBS result, uh, as providers, you will be required to submit the DOH 4189 provider reporting form. So this 4189 provider reporting form is for HIV only, and it is not for rapid testing. It is specifically if you conduct a DBS that you send into Wadsworth and they let you know that, yes, we received a reactive, a, a positive right, result. That's when you would fill out this 4189 provider reporting form. It needs to be filled out, once again, no more than 14 days, but best practices is to complete it as soon as you receive the result from Wadsworth. Please complete all provider reporting forms via the EPRF in the HIV AIDS provider portal application in HCS. So once again, you know, it's another application in HCS, which all of you have, um, all of you at least have someone at your agency that has access to it because you all already have testing programs set up. Now, to move on to talk about confirmed. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. What table? You... Did you have a question? Yeah, I guess so. I don't, I don't think they have a question, so we're going to move on. <laughs> okay. So now talking, switching to talk about reactive HCV DBS results, right? So reactive is just another kind of word for, for positive. Um, the local health department, because HCV is reported local health department wise, will reach out and partner with providers. Now, it is, of course, going to be reported to the local health department in which the patient resides. So it may be in a different county than what you're conducting the test in. Um, they will reach out and partner with you on complete, completing the DOH 389, which is the confidential case report form. So you do not need to do that form immediately for HCV reactive results. Um, they will reach out to you, the local health department, and partner with you Sorry. to complete that. Okay, just a reminder to everyone, if you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Okay, um, the link to the 309 can be found here. Um, and also the second link is instructions on how to complete it. Okay. These are just some great helpful links um, that you can click on that will um, kind of help you to figure out if you get confused on what's reportable and what isn't. All right, now the tutorial for the 4189 provider reported form. Okay. So same thing, you log into your HCS account. Uh, under your applications, instead of selecting CLIMS, you would select the HIV AIDS provider portal. Um, then on the home page, you'll select the EPRF data entry. Um, and we're going to go through screenshots right after this. Um, it will take you to the electronic version of the provider reporting form. Um, required fields are marked with a red asterisk and red text. And please fill out the four data entry sections below and then click Submit. Now, this is also the preferred way that this form is filled out. If for some reason your computer systems are down, there is a kind of lengthy carbon copy version that can be faxed in, but this is the preferred way that this form should be filled out. Now, remember, this form is specifically for HIV if you receive a reactive DBS confirmatory result. Okay, so. You, once you log into HCS and you click on the HIV and AIDS provider portal, you're gonna to come to the EPRF data entry and click on that. Then um, in the select address window, your agency will already pre-populate because you're already in the system because you have a testing program registered with us. So you'll just select your agency and then the document source, which is the basically the type of visit that occurred. Then click the data entry button. 
Um, then you want to make sure that when you're on the patient information, you complete as many of these sections as possible. Please be reminded that anything that's in red or asterisk is required to move forward. Um, on number six, if you don't have any client risk and the client has declined to provide that information, please don't leave it blank. Just select the UNK for unknown. For the type of report, if it's a new diagnosis, the exact date of diagnosis is required, which you'll have on the lab report. Um, and at minimum, the year of diagnosis is required for previously diagnosed individuals. So if someone, this is not a new diagnosis for them, you wanna at least ask them the year that they were diagnosed. Okay, HIV testing history information. Um, this section is required. Uh, if you're submitting this form for an initial or new HIV diagnosis that has not been recorded before in the Department of Health. Um, if antiretroviral therapy is used, um, please document it, specify if it was for PrEP, uh, PEP, or for HIV treatment. Um, please also include any specific medications the client takes if available. So these are all best practices. Um, now, partner contact information, which is particularly important. If the client is willing to offer, and we really hope that they are, partner contact information, um, this is for um, known sexual or needle sharing partners, right? This whole section here. The last name is required if any partner or contact information is being reported. Um, if there are multiple partners, just um, add each partner's information and then hit the save partner below and it will, a uh, new screen will populate and you can add additional uh, partner information. Okay, so provider information. So that's all of you. So your name and um, your license information, provider's name, all of that will, you know, po populate based on what you put into um, the data entry window. Please review all of this, make sure it's correct. Make sure that if whoever is gonna be receiving these results at your agency, put their name and phone number, you know, and or email in there. So we make sure to know who to reach out to. Make sure that you follow your agency's protocols for filling out the section. Um, every agency will have a different person um, who would be receiving these test results. Then you'll click submit. Christy, there's and, a question in the yeah. chat asking if you what if the tester doesn't know the partner's name? Um, if they don't know the partner's name, unfortunately, then <clears throat> there isn't. It, do they have any partner contact information like phone or e email? So, so put in whatever information you have. Yeah, put it exactly. Put in whatever information that you have. Um, I know, can, especially, you know, it can be easier said than done. Not all partner, you know, they may not know their partner's you know, they might know the first name, but not the last name. So basically we just do, um, these are all best practices. In theory, obviously we just do the best that we can with gaining the information that we can from clients. Uh, and we wanna remind them too, that it's confidential. So, um, and, and folks can choose ways that their partners are notified. Partners, they can be, no, you know, partners can be notified Oh, you've been exposed to some something. Um, they don't, you know, partners can choose their level of, privacy and confidentiality in terms of notifying their partners. And partner services is fantastic with helping with that. Okay, so if you have any questions about reporting, uh, you can definitely reach out to the Epidemiology Bureau um, and their email is fantastic. I've reached out to them before um, and their phone number is listed for you here if you have any questions. And you can also ask me. Okay. Now, our last part is receiving electronic test results via HCS. We're just gonna go through this briefly because the majority of you um, are that, that receive results are already seasoned in doing this. So same thing, you will need an HCS account. Any questions, you can reach out to outreach support at health.newyork.gov. Wadsworth, so the lab is solely providing test results for you know the, um, let's say the urine samples for chlamydia and gonorrhea that you might submit. They are solely providing test results via CLIMS. So any test results that you're submitting to the lab, they are providing test results online. They're not providing paper printed out copies. Um, but the great thing to do um, that you can do online in the CLIMS application is track your specimens. So find out you know, where they are in processing, especially if clients are concerned and want to know where their specimens are at in terms of being processed. Um, you can receive those email notifications when the results are available so you know and can go right in and you can view all the test results. So it's actually really handy. Um, so we're not gonna go over this too much in detail, but this is just kind of how you, once again, we already, 
um, get access to HCS and the CLIMS application to receive your test results. Um, you can log into HCS, select the CLIMS application, and then you'll select either specimen reports or specimen receipts. Um, your reports, your results will be available for 90 days. Um, and then if you want to set up email notifications, which I highly recommend if you are the person at your agency who receives results, click on my preferences and enable email notification. So that about sums up our DBS training. I know that was what we, we covered a lot. Um, please, as a reminder, if you have not put your name, the agency you work for and your work email so that we can not only keep track and verify your attendance, but also so that you make sure to receive the handouts and the PDF version of the slides. So we'll kind of wrap things up by, this is a great time to answer or ask any questions that we didn't cover. Do, you know, it doesn't matter what section of it of the training it's about, feel free to ask any questions now, whether it be um, unmuting yourself or placing them in the chat. Hi, I have a, I have a question. Um, if we wanted to, just to do a refresher, Will we be able to just go ahead and jump into the, the next training that's scheduled for September? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Got it. No problem. Yeah. If, yeah. If you feel like you want another refresher, you're welcome to join. Send link to your colleagues. Absolutely. We'll just give it a, a minute or so to see if anyone has any other additional questions. Oh, you know what? One thing that I did want to mention while people are thinking of questions that they have. When we are talking about the infectious disease requisition form, right, the 4463, um, there's an option to hit, instead of hit add a patient, you can hit create test template. If you accidentally hit create test template instead of add a patient, that's okay, no problem. But when you get to one of the sort of pages where it's got the test info, it's going to give you an error. That means that you, um, you didn't submit the, put the submitter specimen number, which is the TCID in. So what you're gonna have to do is hit edit tests and put that in there. So that's okay that you did that. We see this happen a lot, but just, we just wanna let you know that you remedy that by hitting edit tests and then just put in that TCID and click save and you're good to go. Um, another thing is sometimes we see folks forgetting to enter a collection date in the ROE for the 4463. Unfortunately, the website will allow you to proceed um, and it'll say, oh, you're, you know, 4463 has been submitted. It's lying, it has not been <laughs> submitted. <clears throat> um, so you have to ensure you reach that shipping manifest. Um, if you form before that, you know, shipping manifest where it says print order to actually have submitted it. If you aren't able to print out that shipping manifest, even if it tells you you've submitted it, you haven't. So the best way to do that, if you've forgotten the collection date, is to go to order management, select your facility, um, and then go under the pre-collection orders, click on the tracking ID, and then enter the collection date and hit save. So if you run into that error, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to walk you through it because I know that was a lot of information all at once. It happens very commonly. So if you run into that error and you're like, hey, I don't understand what's going on, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to walk you through it. Okay. Martha, any questions we missed in the chat? No, nope. uh, folks are just putting in their contact information. Yes, yeah, please. Um, I'm gonna leave the meeting running for a few minutes because um, we're about to wrap up um, just so everyone can get a chance to put their um, name agency and their e work email in there. And I'm going to make sure to save all of that so that I can get the slides out to everyone. So if there aren't any additional questions, that sums it up. Um, thank you for bearing with me. I know the information was lengthy. We really hope that this is helpful from start to finish um, for understanding how to run DBS, how to package and, and ship it, and also how to fill out all the required reporting forms that go along with it. Um, I am the HIV testing coordinator for the division. Um, so please, if this is my contact information, reach out with any questions or concerns that you have. And once again, as Adonis mentioned, our, we will have this exact duplicate session offered on 9.15 at 10 a.m. So we thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, and we'll leave this running for a few minutes so folks can put their contact information in the chat. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the information. You're welcome, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Have a good day. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank I'm you so sir. happy this was helpful. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.